Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Aquarium of the Pacific's Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Emily, and I am on the education team here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. Today, I am joined by my friend Stacy in studio, and we are so excited to see you today or to hear from you today. If you have any questions during our program, we would love to hear from you. Feel free to text us at 562 286 188 and if you are watching this maybe on YouTube or like after we're live, you can email us at live at lbaop.org and we will email you back. We'd love to hear from our learners out there. Now, today we are going to be learning about places in the ocean where animals live. Now, let's pause for a second. We as scientists, including me and you, we have a word that we use for uh, when we want to talk about the home where a living thing is found. Does anybody know the word that we as scientists use when we talk about the home where a living thing might be found? Hmm. Do you want a hint? Let's see. If, if, is the word that you're thinking of, does it start with the letter H? Does that help? Yeah, so today we are gonna be learning about habitats in the ocean. Now in the ocean, when you think of the ocean, what are some words that come to mind? You can feel free to text us in too. But like when you think of words that describe the ocean, any, any words come to mind? Hmm, well look, look around me for some inspiration here in Shark Lagoon. Oh, maybe, Go ahead and call it out too. What words come to mind when you think of the ocean, if you were describing the ocean? Ooh, maybe watery. That's a good one. Maybe blue from the last time you looked out at the ocean from the beach or you saw it in a movie. You saw it here behind me in Shark Lagoon. Okay, maybe blue. <gasps> Did anybody say salty by chance? Yeah, so it turns out the ocean we know is a big place on earth. It takes up maybe about 75, 70, 75% of our earth. So there's a lot of, whoa, there's a lot of water out there. But it turns out even though the ocean is a really big place, there are lots of what I call kind of like neighborhoods, different habitats in the ocean, because it turns out different parts of the ocean all around the earth are different from each other. So for example, if we were to travel all the way up to the top, of the planet or all the way to the bottom of our planet. What do you think the ocean is like on the top and the bottom of the planet? Hmm. What about in the middle of the planet, like around the, the, the middle, the equator, the belt of the earth? What do you think the ocean is like there if we were to go swimming there? What about here in Southern California? What's the ocean like he here in Southern California for those of you that live here in Southern California like me? Well, let's start by investigating my ocean backyard here in Southern California. So in just a moment, I'm gonna have Stacy change the view here and we're gonna take a look at my ocean backyard. So let's take a look here. Now, is, if we were to go swimming off of Long Beach and go swim, 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 swim way offshore and look down, this is kind of what we would see. What do you notice? about this habitat, this place where living things make their home. What living things do you see? What movement do you see? Hmm. It's a pretty relaxing place, isn't it? Oh, I'm actually not moving in synchrony with it though. <laughs> it's harder than you think. You can try at home too if you want. This, this habitat is sort of moving a little bit, right? relaxing movement. Did you notice the things that were living here? Let's take a look. Oh, did you by chance see this seaweed? Or maybe this seaweed, different kinds of seaweed? And they're just drifting and going with the flow, right? Did you notice how many fish were here? A bunch of different fish, right? And they're mostly just hanging out. There's a couple of them that are actually swimming around and maybe we'll see um, see if you recognize any of the ones that are swimming around. Oh my gosh, like this one swimming around here. Well, who is that? 
right? That looks like, looks like a shark, right? So there's all different kinds of animals that live in this ocean habitat. Now here off of our coast in Southern California, when I think of our coastline, we are so lucky because we actually have this right here. It's a type of seaweed. It looks like a plant and it's called kelp. Now it's not quite a plant. It actually, if you were to touch it, has anybody ever touched it before, by the way? If you've been on a beach with kelp, sometimes it's kind of stinky a little bit. I always like to touch it and look at it though, because it turns out it feels kind of rubbery, right? Um, so check this out. What do you notice about our seaweed here? Whoa, it's really tall, isn't it? And it's moving a little bit. And there's a lot of it, right? Oh, look how pretty this is with the sun coming through, right? So what I think is really cool about these kelp forests is that kelp can grow real, this kind of kelp can grow really, really tall. It grows two feet a day if all the conditions are right. And it starts from the seafloor and goes all the way to the surface. And in fact, when it hits the surface, it still keeps growing and it sort of forms like a little roof on top of us. You know what it kind of makes me think of? Is the rainforest on land. Has anybody ever seen pictures of the rainforest or read about the rainforest? Yeah, rainforests like the Amazon in South America have lots of trees and plants and it rains a lot there. And the trees are, there's so many that it makes it kind of dark there. Sometimes these kelp forests, there's so much kelp that it makes it kind of dark there too. But you can actually see when the, when the sun is able to like poke right through the top. But you can also see that it's a shadowy place. So let's take a look back at some animals that live in this habitat because this turns out is a great place for animals to hide in. And when there's a lot of nice places to hide, maybe lots of them come here. The other thing that's really great about the kelp forest habitat is that there's lots of nutrients in this area, which means that lots can grow here. The food web, we can support a big food web here. And so there's lots and lots of nutrients, lots of places for animals to hide, lots of places for them to, to eat and hunt, and sometimes even like lay their eggs, have their babies and, and grow up here. So it turns out the kelp forest is a really diverse habitat which means that there's lots of different types of things here. So let's take a look at some of the critters that we find in a kelp forest habitat. Now, this happens to be a view of one of our largest exhibits here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and it's modeled, it models a, a kelp forest habitat. So let's pause for a moment and take a look. What do you notice here? Whoa, does anybody see a really Big fish, maybe, whoa, <gasps> did you see, watch this big fish right here. What do you notice on that big fish? What colors do you see? Do you see any patterns? I'll step out of the way so you can take a look again. Wow, hmm, I notice, I see that this fish right here is kind of like a grayish, brownish, grayish, dark slate color, right? Did you notice any patterns too? You can call it out. Yeah, there's spots on there, right? So a lot of animals that live in these kelp forest habitats where it can be kind of dark and there's like lots of shadows and things, you can see they have these markings and this helps them to hide a little bit better. Let's also look, oh, this, by the way, this animal is called a giant sea bass. And we happen to have three of them that live inside of this habitat, though we have a couple more that live here at the aquarium. So check this giant sea bass out. Now, I know it's a little bit hard to tell, but this fish is really big, really big. One of our larger fish here at the aquarium. Oh, there's another one way back there. So we can see this is a really, really big fish with these big spots. The other cool thing about this fish, well, let's take a look. How, how do you, uh, or how do you, what do you notice about the way it moves? So check this out. One of them is kind of hanging out. One of them's actually swimming. Can you see it? It's actually just over the top of our view here. Do you think that's a, oh, here comes another one. How lucky. Everybody, this is a view of all three of our giant sea bass in this habitat right now. This is a kelp forest habitat. What do you notice about their movement? It's kind of 
slow and steady, right? Yeah, oh, there's another, there's another creature there moving through our exhibit right here. Whoa. Okay, take a look. There are those spots. Take a look at its tail. Now it turns out the tail says a lot about the way that a fish moves. When fish are slow and steady swimmers, they usually have a tail shaped like the giant sea bass right here. Let's take another look at a still picture so we, we can see how it actually looks without it moving around. But you can see, see how this tail almost looks like, um, almost to me it looks like a paintbrush, right? Like sort of one of those plain paintbrushes and, uh, or like sort of like someone stuck a triangle into this, uh, the end of the fish. It's flat on the edge and when they move, they move it nice and steady and slow. So when you see a tail like this, it's a slow and steady swimmer. Also, we did notice, or I'm not sure if you caught it, but I noticed that one of those giant sea bass was also just like hanging out on the bottom there, right? Let's look at some other things about this creature that lives in this kelp forest habitat. Um, take a look at its mouth right here. What do you notice about the mouth? Is it big or little? It's pretty big, right? Let's look, whoa, that's a big mouth. Excellent, Stacy. I'm so glad you found it here. Look at this big mouth right here. Now, these big mouths tell us something about this, the way that this fish eats too. So you can see it's a big mouth and it's sort of pointed upward. It almost looks like a big frown. And when I think about a mouth like this, sorry, like this, um, it makes me think of, you know, like a cartoon castle and you have like the drawbridge that comes up the door that closes and then the door opens. And so what happens is these fish are just like kind of sit around and wait for their food to come nearby and then they open their mouth fast and then close it and it pulls lots of food in that way. So they're, they're sort of like wait and uh, ambush predators. So they just like hang out and then they will snap their food in because they have that big door of a mouth that comes all the way up and opens and then closes again. Great view. Oh, you can even see its tongue in there. What else do you notice now that we have this awesome view? Oh, here comes another one. Look at those giant mouths, everybody. What's kind of cool is it makes sense. If your mouth, is, if you just hang out and wait for food to kind of come towards you, it makes a lot of sense that this fish hangs out at the bottom, which is where we're noticing it. We see the rocks around here. You can see this one just hanging out. Yeah. How lucky we are to see this in our kelp forest habitat. Now, I wonder if we can see maybe a, whoa, whoa. I hope I didn't do that. I'm joking, I know I didn't do that. Uh, so we can see a great view again. Oh, there's the tail, there's the tail. Let's watch it swim really quick. Slow and steady. Oh, there's another animal that lives here. Did anybody see that one? Yeah, pretty cool. If you had to name this shark, what kind of name would you give it? Yeah, this is a really common shark found here in the kelp forest habitat in Southern California. Remember, remember we said it was kind of like shadowy and kind of dark, everything sort of like gray, green, brown. So we see that the predators, even like this, this shark right here, around the same coloration. This happens to be a leopard shark. Can you see why we might call it a leopard shark? What do you notice? All those great spots. How do you think these spots help this shark? Hmm. Pretty interesting to think about, right? What do you think? Feel free to text in too if you have any observations or comments that you want to add. All right, so maybe these spots help this shark. Any thoughts? So this is a leopard shark. Now this shark is actually, it's kind of hard to tell the scale in that view, but this shark, these sharks can be about four or five feet long. And I know it's hard to tell how tall I am, but um, I'm about five feet tall. So I'm a like me small, medium sized grown up. And this leopard shark, if I were to lay down, this leopard shark is about my size in real life, but they're, they're like narrow bodied, right? So let's take a look at some other things that we notice about this shark. Where's its mouth, do you think? Hmm. Different than the giant sea bass mouth, right? Remember the giant sea bass mouth had that big frowny mouth that was like a big door? This one has a mouth that's a little bit more 
it's a little harder to see, but it's right here, kind of on the bottom. And it's not a very big mouth. So it turns out, with all fish, the mouth says a lot about what they eat. And their fins say a lot about the way they move. So here we are, a nice other view here. Oh, look, there's our leopard shark. What do you notice about its tail? It didn't have a big flat tail like our uh, giant sea bass, right? No, it actually, so sharks actually have um, tails that are like forked, right? So they actually, it looks like a wedge almost. It looks like, a, or like kind of boomerang shaped or sort of like a not even boomerang, right? Um, or another way to think about it is uh, if you, if any of you are doing in math like less than or greater than signs, right? That's kind of what it looks like or like a sideways V. Ooh, so many. Nice view of our uh, giant sea bass here. But you can tell uh, by the tail, the leopard shark moves in a really different way than these giant sea bass because they have a tail that's a little bit more V-shaped. And V-shape is better for burst swimming and speed swimming, moving back and forth. Um, Stacy, is there a picture of a yellow tail by chance on there? Or anything that's a faster fish? Okay. I wasn't sure what we had ready to go in the picture bank back there. Um, but if you were to think about like a tuna or if you Google a picture like a tuna um, or any of the jacks, anything like that, they have a tail that's like this. And so when they swim, they can swim super fast. They can sometimes even swim. Um, a swordfish is even faster than that. A swordfish or any of those types of um, sailfish can swim as fast as maybe like a car driving through a neighborhood. Um, pretty fast swimmers there. All right, so we've explored a little bit about our Southern California habitat, but let's take a trip to maybe, do we want to go someplace warmer? What do you think? I kind of want to go someplace warmer. And let's compare how this warmer place, this warmer habitat is a little different than maybe what we've been looking at. How are the living things a little bit different there? What do you notice about the habitat we're about to show you? And you can feel free to text in any of your questions here. Oh, take a look at this habitat. Different, isn't it? A little bit different. Now, I know you can't actually feel the temperature here, but in the SoCal, in the Southern California, the kelp forest habitat, the water's like 60 degrees. This water is more like if you were to draw a warm, relaxing bath and get in the bath there. That's what this water is a little bit more like. It's nice and warm. Okay, so here, what do you notice about this habitat? Still the ocean, right? Now, we did get a, a great question earlier about the ocean, just the ocean in general. And that question was, will the ocean get less salty? That's a great question out there. And so uh, it turns out the average salinity or how we measure the saltiness of the ocean, the ad average saltiness of the ocean is pretty stable. The only places where you see changes in, um, in the saltiness of the water might be where there's lots of fresh water coming in at some point. Where can you imagine there's fresh water touching salt water? Where might that happen out in the environment, out in nature? Hmm. Where could we find fresh water coming in but salt water already there. I have an idea. How about rivers? Or maybe where a river touches the ocean, right? Anytime you have a, a waterway that's from land that touches the ocean, like a river mouth, that's when you might actually see the saltiness of the water change. And that's actually kind of an interesting experiment to go out there and sort of measure it. And scientists will actually often do that because those environments where it's salty and fresh sort of mixing are really, really um, diverse and the animals that live there are really unique. Um, so a lot of places like wetlands and like river mouths and stuff are really uh, high places of scientific study. It's also kind of nice because a lot of times where the rivers meet the ocean are actually close to where people live and can travel and study. And so that makes some really interesting places to study as well. In general though, the average saltiness of the ocean is pretty stable. And feel free to text us any other questions right here, 562-286-1838. In the meantime, let's check out this habitat here. I told you it's nice and warm. What else do you notice? Does it have the kelp, the seaweed moving back and forth? 
No, but I see a lot of other movement here, don't you? Yeah, I notice that there's lots and lots of fish here. I also notice there's a bunch of these stony, rocky looking things. Does anybody know what those might be? Have you ever seen anything like this before? What kind of habitat is this? It's not a kelp forest anymore. Huh. Anybody know the name of what this habitat might be? It's named after all the creatures that are living back there that aren't fish. Maybe let's take a closer look. I'm going to show you a piece of coral. So let's go over to my other camera right here, and I'm going to show you um, a coral skeleton. Now let me try and make it a little bit different. So you can, oops, there we go. Oops, let me see if I can get it more contrasty. Oh no, that's not helping. Yeah, there we go. I just had to zoom in just a little bit. Now this right here is a piece of coral. Now it's actually about the size of my hand, I'll go show you, but I'm projecting it behind me. So here's my hand. This is a piece of coral. Now the habitat that's in that warm water with all the fish in it is a coral reef habitat. Maybe you've seen it before, maybe in a movie or anything like that, or books, right, or an aquarium. And the coral is actually the foundation of that habitat, where the kelp, the seaweed, was the, the foundation, sort of like the thing that provides a place for all the animals to live there. So here we have um, coral, and we'll take a look. What do you notice about this coral? I'm going to zoom way in here. Whoa! Now this coral is not just smooth, is it? I see in here lots of little holes. And inside each of those holes is a living creature. So it turns out that coral reef habitat that we were looking at is a living landscape. And all those things that were bumpy and rocky looking, the corals there are actually animals. Not only is it an animal, it's what we call a colonial animal. It's lots of animals that share one skeleton. Can you imagine what it would be like if you share a skeleton with your best friends and best cousins and things? Yeah, that's what it's like to be a coral. You, here's a way zoomed in picture of corals. Uh, and so this is a coral that's living. And you can see each one of these little bumps with the little tentacles there, that's one creature. And they all, all of these are living on one skeleton together. So what they do, this is a living creature and they hunt for food with those stinging tentacles. Uh, and this is, this is actually, they remind me of something I've seen before. Has anybody ever seen anemones? Yeah, that's because anemones are like the cousin of a coral. And all of these uh, corals, they're feeding this way. But there's something else that's really cool about corals. And that is they have uh, something that lives inside of them that also helps them to get food. They have algae that lives inside of them. And that algae actually gets energy from the sun and it takes in carbon dioxide and water and it actually makes food for the coral too. So the coral gets its food in two different ways. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could both eat and then just go out into the sun and make our own food too? I would love that. I would be, I would eat all the time then, which is kind of the dream, isn't it? So here we have uh, all of these corals that are both hunting and also using their algae that live inside of them to grow their own food. Now, maybe uh, Miss Stacy can take us back to a different coral reef and we can look at what that looks like when we see lots of different types of corals. Here's a beautiful view of lots of different shapes of corals. Now, each one of these corals that like these bumpy lumpy things with all different shapes, it just means they have different, there are different types of corals and they have different skeletons underneath. So the actual coral shapes that you see, this is the piece I was showing you before, uh, and it, it's very similar to like these like branching, almost like antler ones, right? But then there's some coral skeletons that look like um, lettuce. There's some that look kind of like, oh, there's some that look like brains. There's some that look more like, uh, kind of like hands almost. They have all these different shapes. This is actually one of the reasons why I like to draw coral reefs, like just a doodle, a coral reef picture, because it's all these crazy wild shapes and you just, you can just invent um, that. And there's probably something that looks kind of like that in real life at the coral reef. 
Um, so they look all di like different things. Oh, some of these look like little bouquets of flowers and things like that. So lots of great shapes. And actually, it's a little hard to tell because of the lighting in here, but it turns out different corals also have lots of different colors. And when it's lots of different colors, you can actually see that it makes a great home for lots of different fish with different colors. So here we are, and you can see there's like purplish, greenish, reddish, all sorts of different types of corals. So coral reefs are really, really diverse habitat. Uh, maybe Stacy, let's go ahead and look at uh, some of the critters that live there. You can pick one. Let's see what we see. <gasps> One of my favorite critters that lives in the coral reef. What do you notice about this animal? What kind of animal is it? Good, it's a fish, definitely, we agree. So this fish, what do you notice about it though? What about its colors? Wow, it has a ton of different colors, doesn't it? All these bright colors, because remember how brightly colored that coral reef is? It turns out the animals that live on the coral reef can be really brightly colored too they're still blending in. Now there's another thing that I notice about this fish and that has to do with its mouth. Take a look at its mouth. It's not, it doesn't have the same shape mouth as our giant sea bass friend, right? Remember our giant sea bass friend had that big frown and it opens like a door? This one has a mouth that's more like on the end, right? And sort of picks at the end. Do you think that the giant sea bass and this fish uh, eat the same thing? Probably not. Their mouths are really different, right? Also, they live in really different places. So maybe the food is different in those different habitats. So let's take a look at the mouth here. And maybe Stacy, oh, we got to zoom in. What do you notice about this mouth right here? Do you see that? Yeah, it's true. There are teeth in there. And what's really cool about these teeth is that this helps the, this animal, which is called a parrotfish, it helps a parrotfish to eat. And it, their teeth, remember I said their teeth, your teeth say a lot about the way that you eat and your fins tell you a lot about the way you swim. So it turns out this fish right here has these really strong teeth because they like to graze on the coral reef. And so sometimes they'll eat algae, sometimes they'll nibble on the coral pieces um, a little bit and they, they have to have the right chompers to scrape and chomp on little pieces of the food that they're eating. Um, Stacy, can we show maybe one more picture of a uh, parrotfish teeth so we can see another view? Okay, get ready. I'm going to step out of the way here. Check out the smile on this fish. I love it. I love the way that this fish looks because it's kind of like Right? Like it has like this great little set of teeth there. Um, and th these fused teeth right here actually are those scraping, chomping teeth, right? And that's how they actually eat their food, which I think is really interesting. So the adaptations, the way that this animal survives depends on things like, uh, well, its teeth are its adaptations, the color, the fins, everything about this animal tells us that this animal is a specialist at living in the coral reef habitat. All right. Now, I do have time for a couple of questions. I did see a question come in, and it's actually about the kelp forest. So maybe we'll squ switch back to a kelp forest habitat as we wrap up. And uh, beautiful. This is our local, remember, cooler water, Southern California kelp forest. And we got a great question from a viewer about how do kelp reproduce? Oh, this is another great image. You can see how diverse these habitats are. Look at all these California sea lions. Now, kelp are really interesting because they grow kind of like a plant do, but they don't really act quite like plants. And they actually have a really complex, what we call a life cycle. So when we think of plants, we think of plants that have pollen, and then the pollen um, will help the, the um, reproductive parts of the, fl uh, the flower, the plant, disperse. Um, or we think about like seeds growing into a seedling, growing into a plant. The plant may flower and then may fruit and that provides seeds again, okay? So those things, those parts are really important on plants and land, but it turns out um, kelp actually have a really complex life cycle, part, way, um, part of which they may copy themselves. So they just bud new parts. Um, and then part, sometimes they also do release kind of something that's a little bit more, it's, it's more like spores or um, 
kind of a little more like pollen. It's really different though, and it's really complex. So um, they actually ha have just a really unusual life cycle. And that is because uh, they aren't plants. They're actually in um, the pro kingdom protist. So that's the protista. So it's actually more related to um, like the little microscopic um, little uh, amoebas and things like that. So a whole different thing than, than plants. Um, so it's a really complex life cycle. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day, and we look forward to hearing from you again soon. Bye, everybody.